Well, good morning. It is good to see all of you here today. I can't think of a better way to transition from one year to the next than to worship together and study God's word together. Can you? I don't think so. Uh, I've entitled the message this morning, How to Respond When God Says No. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 22. 1 Chronicles chapter 22. Here at Calvary Bible Church, we place a very high value on the word of God. So if you don't have a Bible today, on your way out, we have a couple of stacks out there. Uh, we want you to have one. I can't think of a better way to start the new year either uh, than with the word of God. It's an adventure like you'll never experience at any other point in your life. First Chronicles 22, if you can turn there. If you found your place, uh, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we thank you that we can be in your presence today. We thank you for the local body. We thank you that we can spend time together. Holy Spirit, I pray that each of us sees exactly what you have for us today and that you would help us to apply it individually to our lives. We believe that your word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. However, we know that the evil one does not want that for us. And so, Lord, we take the provision given to us in Ephesians 6. We claim the helmet of salvation by faith. And by faith, we put on the breastplate of righteousness. We gird our loins about with the belt of truth. And we ready our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We take in our hands the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, our Bibles. But above all, Lord, we take the shield of faith with which to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one that will come at us. And so, Lord, protect us, but not so much that you can't use us. In Jesus' name, amen. First Chronicles 22, 1 to 13. I'm going to read that to you. It says, Then David said, This is the house of the Lord God, and this is the altar of the burnt offering of Israel. And so David commanded to gather the aliens who were in the land of Israel, and he appointed masons to cut hewn stones to build the house of God. And David prepared iron in abundance for the nails and for the doors and for the gates and for the joints and for the bronze in abundance beyond measure and cedar trees in abundance. For the Sidonians and those from Tyre brought much cedar wood to David. Now David said, Solomon, my son, is young and inexperienced, and the house to be built for the Lord must be exceedingly magnificent famous and glorious throughout all countries. I will now make provision for it. And so David made abundant provisions before his death. And he called for his son, his son Solomon, and he charged him to build a house for the Lord God of Israel. And David said to Solomon, my son, as for me, it was in my mind to build the house to the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me saying, You've shed much blood and have made great wars, and you shall not build a house for my name because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. Behold, a son shall be born to you who shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies around, and his name shall be Solomon. For I will give him peace and quietness to Israel in his days. He shall build a house for my name, and he shall be my son, and I will be his father." And I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. Now, my son, may the Lord be with you and may you prosper. And build the house of the Lord your God as he has said to you. Only may the Lord give you wisdom and understanding and give you charge concerning Israel that you may keep the law of the Lord your God. Then you will prosper if you take care to fulfill the statutes and judgments with which the Lord charged Moses concerning Israel. Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear or be dismayed. You know, everyone here today is going through some stage of life, each and every one of us in this congregation. Uh, I think Pastor Tally has married more couples together in the past three years than he has his whole time here. There's just been a lot of new marriages. So we have that stage of life going on. And as a result, as was mentioned this morning, there's a lot of babies <laughs> being born. That nursery is full like at no other time I've seen since I've been here. There's a lot. And so we have 
that stage of life going on as well. Uh, all the newlyweds seem to be expecting also. It just seems to be in the air. Uh, some of you are going through the teenage years, a time in your life that has more change than any other time in life, physically, emotionally, uh, socially. There's no other time in your life where there'll be this much change. I'm sorry to disappoint you if you thought it would be, uh, it's in another phase, but, but really there isn't. Uh, there's just a lot in that stage of life. Some of us as, as parents with teenagers are experiencing that phase again. And that's all I'll say about that because I have a couple. And, uh, you know, I'd hate my first time preaching to be my last. So <laughs> that's all I'll say about that. And then there's another group uh, here that, that's well represented also. It's the empty nesters. Your kids have just moved out, and it's just the two of you. And life is like it was with just the two of you only decades later. You're spending a lot of quality time together. Uh, some of you I see in separate life group classes now. You know what? And that's okay. No judgment here. Uh, and not at all. And then there are, are more mature members uh, in our congregation who are experiencing the joy of being a grandparent. Now for you, physically life has become harder. We can see it. Uh, your calendar is decorated with doctor's appointments. But if being a grandparent is half as good as you make it look, I can't wait. Well, I can wait, not yet. <laughs> but you make it look wonderful and, you know, it just seems amazing. I look forward to it someday. You know, just a few years ago, I was at you know, my annual doctor's appointment, and he shared with me that uh, just that year, the American Medical Association had reduced the age from 50, you guessed it, to 45 for some more additional and invasive appointments that I should take part in. And uh, it wouldn't have been so bad if he didn't seem so, I don't know, joyful and happy about it, you know? <laughs> um, but, you know, you think I won the office raffle, but I had not. <laughs> uh, and I didn't really care for that. So, uh, so my new doctor, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we wouldn't do that. We don't cancel people. We don't do that. But the truth is, we're all going through different stages in life right now. And what I want us to see today from God's word is that at each stage and at each season of life, you can be faithful and effective for the Lord. Did you know that? It's not just for one season or one stage in your life. God has something for you in each season and each stage where you can be effective for him. And that's exciting, I think. Chapter 22 comes on the heels of a very significant event in the life of King David and the Israelites. And, you know, context is very important when we read scripture. And so I want to give you a little bit of context from chapter 21. What has just happened before? I will not read the whole chapter to you, uh, but I want to give you a little bit of context uh, and we know that David did many great things for the Lord. David was the shepherd boy. He wrote beautiful poetry. He was the warrior turned king, and he was well-loved. No king in Israel was loved more than David. But many of David's sins are also recorded for us in the scriptures. We see them there. And in fact, in chapter 21 of Chronicles, we have one of them. Uh, David did something that the Israelites were not to do, of course, unless the Lord told them. It's something we as a nation do every 10 years. We take a census. We count our people. David wanted to take a census to assess his military might that God had not asked for. In Exodus 30, God gives explicit instructions on Census taking, if you're ever tired at night and you need something to read, read about census taking, Exodus 30. Uh, he gives explicit instructions on how he wants it done and when he wants it done. Now, as a consequence for what David had done, asking for his military might to be assessed, the Lord gave him a consequence. 70,000 men died as a, result, as a result. God sent an angel with a sword. 70,000 men lost their life as a result of the pride of David's sin. 
There was a lot of counting going on after that, not the kind we like. 70,000 men, that's a lot of people. And finally, in this very dramatic scene toward the end of chapter 21, David looks up and he sees the angel of the Lord suspended between heaven and earth. It's a terrifying sight, absolutely terrifying, especially after what has just happened. And in this dramatic scene in verse 21, in 1 Chronicles 21, 16 to 17, it says, And David lifted his eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing between heaven and earth, and in his hand a drawn sword stretched out over Jerusalem. And then David and the elders, clothed in sackcloth, fell on their faces. And David said to God, Was it not I who gave the command to number the people? It is I who have sinned and done this great evil. But these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand, O Lord my God, be against me and my father's house. But do not let this plague be on your people. Now when David repented, the Lord, as he always did and does, he responded, always. In the last few verses of chapter 21, it says this, at this time when David saw that the Lord had answered him at the threshing floor of Oren the Jebusite, he sacrificed there. For the tabernacle of the Lord, which Moses had made in the wilderness and the altar of burnt offering, were at that time in the high place of Gibeon. But David could not go there to inquire of God, for he was afraid of the sword of the angel of the Lord. This was something that he saw, and he saw the effects of it. He was terrified of it. And so when we look at chapter 22 in our passage today, in verse 1, it says, this is the house of the Lord our God, and this is the altar of burnt offering. He's speaking specifically to the place and that altar that has been erected on Oren's threshing floor. Well, it's not actually Oren's threshing floor anymore, is it? David has paid full market value and then some, right? No evaluation, no water test. He paid for it. He bought it. He owns it. And he paid for it out of his own treasure. And this This is the place where the temple will be built, the temple. And to that end, David goes on uh, to commission all different kinds of specialized workers for the different jobs to be done, and there's lots of them. Uh, Verse 2 tells us that he's even brought in aliens. He's brought in people from the outside to quarry the stones, the masons. These were the Phoenicians who were the best at this. And he's brought them in because they are the best at masonry work. In verse 3, we see in chapter 22 that all the metals has been, have been gathered. Iron and bronze have been brought in to be used from everything, from the doors to the gates, right down to the nails. No detail was missed, right down to the nails. We have such detail in the scripture. Uh, and since, of course, there's, there's no Home Depots in that day, in verse 4, we have lumber being brought in, not just any lumber. It says the cedars from Tyre. This is the cedars of Lebanon coming in, the best. Now, historians refer to this as Solomon's temple. Uh, But it seems David is a little bit more involved than his son at this time. And in verses 5 through 6, we see why. Let's just read that one more time. Chapter 22, verses 5 through 6. It says, Now David said, Solomon, my son, is young and inexperienced. And the house to be built for the Lord must be exceedingly magnificent, famous and glorious throughout all countries. I will now make preparation for it. And so David made abundant preparations before his death. And he called for his son Solomon and charged him to build a house for the Lord God of Israel. Solomon at this point, he's only a boy. Um, This is a mammoth effort to do for anyone. And, but that doesn't stop David from charging Solomon with it. And at this point, scholars estimate Solomon's probably somewhere uh, between the ages of, of 12 to 14 at this time. It's hard to pin down, but regardless, he's too young to take on an effort like this. Way too young. Just imagine being Solomon, this young kid. You'll have a part in building the first temple to the Lord God of Israel. Amazing. You know, most kids at that age are looking forward to getting their license, 
uh, playing in a school sport. But Solomon had that to look forward to, right? It's, it's a lot. In verses 7 through 8, uh, we have this father and son moment, but it's in front of all the people as David turns to his boy and he speaks to him in front of everyone. And what David says is very honest and very true, uh, but it still has to be hard for the old king to share with his son, the man after God's own heart. Uh, let me just read that one more time to you. It says, and David said to Solomon, my son, as for me, it was in my mind to build a house to the name of the Lord my God. But the word of the Lord came to me saying, you have shed much blood and have made great wars. and You shall not build a house for my name because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. No is one of the first words we learn as children. It's almost the first word, uh, but in many homes, to the chagrin of young moms, as lots of them are finding out, it's that other two-syllable word. It's not fair that they say da-da first. It really isn't. You carried this child, your body went through all kinds of changes, and then you delivered the child. Uh, so I'm not saying it's fair. Uh, but soon after, the word no comes, and we learn it very quickly. Uh, it's a word we love to say, but we hate to hear. David longed to build a temple for the Lord. It was in his mind. Uh, a better uh, rendering of that in the Hebrew is the word labah, but it's actually heart. Uh, it was in his heart to do this. By it, he wanted to proclaim to every nation the greatness of the Lord. Bravo, David. That's what you ought to do. In 1 Samuel 13, 14, when Samuel was informing Saul that the kingdom was being taken from him and given to another, the Lord, uh, we're told that the Lord had sought out a man after his own heart. Or another way of saying that is a man with God's interest at heart. His priorities align with God's priorities. Now having said that, David was still told, no, you cannot build a temple, no. Now there are many today that would tell us that we need to listen to our hearts, to our, allow our hearts to guide and to direct our decisions that we make every day. What I see in the scripture is that David's heart told him to build a temple. It was in his heart to build a temple. But God told him he didn't want him to. He said no. David's heart was leading him to do exactly what the Lord did not want him to do. It was leading him in the opposite direction of the Lord's will. You know, there are many voices today telling us to follow our hearts. The problem with that, for me as a person, is that my heart has been polluted by sin. Uh, and by the way, that's you too. And I cannot trust my heart. Uh, my sin has contaminated it in a way that it wasn't meant to be. And it is at best very unreliable, extremely unreliable. The prophet Jeremiah tells us this in chapter 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? David knew what he was capable of. And he, more than most people, would have understood the diagnosis given by Jeremiah. David had done a lot in his life, both good and bad, and he would have understood this. In fact, he wrote in Psalm 51.10, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. David was crying out to God, saying, Lord, give me a new heart. This one I've got is like a broken GPS. It takes me to places I shouldn't go, and there I do things I shouldn't do. That's what he's saying. And he understood that more than most. David got it. You see, David had not just shed blood in places where it could be justified like war. David had shed lots of innocent blood too. And that occurred before he was ever king and before Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, had been murdered by him. There was a stage in life, a 16-month period that you'll not hear about often in David's life. Saul was chasing him for many years 
and he was on the run. And David ran to Gath to escape him. And he took his personal army and their families with him. But he didn't just live there. Turn with me to 1 Samuel 27. 1 Samuel 27. And this is the account of David's time there in the land of the Philistines. First Samuel 27, it says, And David said in his heart, Now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines. And Saul will despair of me there to seek me any more in any part of Israel. So I shall escape from his hand. Then David arose and he went over with 600 men who were with him to Achish, the son of Maok, king of Gath. And so David dwelt with Achish at Gath. And he and his men, each of their household, and David with his two wives, Ahinam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the Carmelitess, Nabal's widow. And it was told Saul that David fled to Gath, and so he sought him no more. Well, that worked. Then David said to Achish, if I have now found favor in your eyes, let them give me a place in some town and country that I may dwell there. For why should I, your servant, dwell in the royal city with you? So Achish gave him Ziklag that day. Therefore, Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. Now, the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was one full year and four months. And David and his men went out and raided the Gerashites and the Gerizites and the Amalekites, for those nations were the inhabitants of the land of from old, as you go to Shur, as far as the land of Egypt. But whenever David attacked the land, he left neither man nor woman alive. But he took away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the apparel, and he returned and came to Achish. Then Achish would say, where have you made a raid today? And David would say, uh, against the southern areas of Judah, or against the southern area of the Jamirites, or against the southern area of the Kenites. David would save neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, saying, lest he should inform on us, saying, thus David did this. And thus was his behavior all the time he dwelt in the country of the Philistines. And so Achish believed David, saying, He has made his people utterly abhor him. Therefore, he will be my servant forever. We're told in many places in the Bible that God punishes those who shed innocent blood. There are consequences for such acts. Exodus 23, 7 tells us the Lord instructs his people and he says, do not kill the innocent and the righteous, for I, for I will not acquit the wicked. The innocent will be given justice. There will be consequences to the one who has shed their blood. In the passage we just read in 1 Samuel, we see David shed innocent blood, and a lot of it. So much so, he was so efficient that word never got back to, to Gath. No one ever heard of him because he wiped them all out. No one could squeal on David. No one would find out. I think this is something we can apply from the scriptures. We see in our passage in 1 Chronicles 22 that David had a healthy relationship with the Lord. He did. One thing we know about David is that when he sinned and was confronted with his sin, he would admit it, he would confess it, and he would repent of it. And in that way, David is a model for all of us. He really is. He's a model for all of us in that way. Now, even as a result of the relationship with the Lord, uh, even though it was restored, even after all the premeditated murder of the innocent, the adultery, the prideful actions, even after all of that, his relationship with the Lord was restored. It's because he did those things. He admitted it. He confess it, and then he repent of it. Praise God for his grace and mercy. I know I need it. But even though forgiveness was given, the relationship was restored, the consequences still remained. David, as great as he was, could not escape the law of sowing and reaping. This occurred at other times in David's life, too. God, speaking through his prophet in 2 Samuel 12, 10, confronted David on his murder and adultery and said, Now, therefore, the sword of the Lord shall never depart from your house because you have despised me 
and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. And if you read about David's children, uh, they did terrible things. Uh, some of them to each other. His family was, was an absolute mess. It was so dysfunctional. If you have just spent some quality time with your, your family over the holidays, you know, you're not feeling good about that, you just read that passage, you're gonna feel a whole lot better. You're gonna be encouraged. Because David's family was an absolute mess, and this is why. David had been forgiven. His relationship restored with the Lord. But one of his consequences was that he was disqualified from building the temple. The Lord said, no. He told him no. Did you know our sins can sometimes disqualify us from doing something? We don't like to think that, but we see it here. You know, David had done a lot of good things in his life. He really had. But he'd also planted some sinful seeds that were now being reaped. In Galatians 6, 7 through 9, we're told, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows, that will, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So let me ask you this. As you begin this new year, what kind of seeds are you planting? Notice I didn't ask you if you're planting seeds or not. You're going to plant seeds. That's not the question. The question is, will you be sowing seeds to the flesh or seeds to the spirit? You know, after both have been planted, they can only be reaped. This is how the law of sowing and reaping works. They can only be reaped. And so restoration in David's life has occurred, but sin still has consequences. And I think we live in a culture that believes when consequences occur that forgiveness and restoration have not. But nothing could be further from the truth. You know, when one of our daughters was young, uh, she was about eight years old, and she lied to us about something. And, you know, lying is something we're not supposed to tolerate in our homes, right? We're supposed to teach our kids, do not lie, right? So we, so we try not to do that. And uh, I remember her saying she's sorry. I remember the waterworks, the little face, you know, it's all red. The fluids are running together from the eyes and the nose coming down the chin. And, oh, it breaks your heart. And they're so adorable at that age. It, it's really hard. Uh, she was genuinely repentant. And as a parent, that's what you want, right? That, that's really what you want. And that was great. But the consequences, they still had to be given. One of the reasons we all need consequences is to remind us, don't do this again, right? That's adults, by the way, sometimes too, right? We need those too sometimes. Um, now, delivering the consequences to Contessa was a little bit of a challenge. If we had known then that she was going to be one of the fastest runners in New England... No, it wouldn't have helped. It was still really hard. <laughs> it was very difficult. And then when you caught her, she would squirm, and oh, it was really difficult. I was in my 30s, but it was exhausting. I hope more than she did that she'd never lie again. <laughs> it was very difficult. Uh, but sometimes, you know, our sin comes with consequences that go so far as to disqualify us from something. Maybe even something that is good and something we'd like to do. That can happen. It could be that some of you have been trying to do something for many years, and it's just not happening. It's just not happening. It's like you're banging your head up against a wall. It feels like an uphill battle that, that makes you try, that makes you feel like you're trying to push open a, a door that feels bolted shut. And you know, it, it could be that God has bolted the door shut. That could be the case. Uh, like David, it might be the Lord telling you, no, preventing you from doing something. It may be as a result of a consequence of sin, or it may be just that the Lord has something else for you where you be more effective for him. I don't know. So what do we, you and I do at times like this in our lives when God says no to us? Because I find that even in our prayers, when I pray, I pray expecting a yes. I don't know about you, but... I don't pray, you know, Lord, I just, I just want you to say no. 
If you could just say no to this, I'd feel so much better. No, I pray expecting a yes, like you. Um, now, I find that that depends on the connection I have with the person. I see sometimes, you know, like you, prayers, prayer requests come through the prayer chain. I see a name of a person I don't know. Our church is getting larger. Asking for prayer for their aunt, maybe. She has, you know, chronic sickness or maybe an injury or something like that. And in that time, I'll find myself praying words like and phrases, Lord, if it's in your will, Lord, if it's in your timing, Lord, uh, please hear that person. Not my will, but yours be done. But you know, when it's someone close to you, like your child, your spouse, uh, your close friend, we don't pray like that, do we? No, we don't. Uh, From that Saturday afternoon, I got the call about my friend John Hoover having stage four uh, prostate cancer. I pulled the car over and I began to pray. Uh, More accurately, I began to beg God, heal him, Lord. I wasn't praying for no, I was praying for yes, just like many of you. Yes, pray, please say yes, Lord, you'll do that. And God has done a miraculous work in his life. And we're grateful for that. But how about those times when God says no? Sometimes he says no. When you strongly desire to go in a certain life direction and God is saying no to you. Time has passed, sometimes decades. Well, what do you do? Do you just try harder? Maybe, maybe give it a little more effort? What do you do? Well, I think in these cases, I think David gives us a great example of what we can do that many of us can benefit from. I know I have. Ask the Lord what you can do for him. Stop complaining about what he's not allowing you to do and ask him what he'd like you to do. You know, you can do that. Don't render yourself ineffective by sulking the rest of your life about something God has said no to you about. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a, a position that you've wanted for so, for so long. Maybe sin has disqualified from you from this. I don't know. Or maybe the Lord just has something else for you. But he has said no to you. What I want you to see this morning is that David did not spend the rest of his life grieving about what he could not do for the Lord. No, instead, he focused on what he could do. First Chronicles 22 tells us that. He looked at what he could do for the Lord, and he did the very best he could, right down to the nails, all the details. You know, this is what the Lord is looking for from you and I, too. Don't get bogged down in all the things you'd like to do for the Lord but cannot do in this life. Do what you can do. In fact, do what the Lord allows you to do. Do what he's guiding you to do and do most of all what he is empowering you to do. By the way, if you're part of Calvary Bible Church, we need you to do that. It's not just a a hope so. We kind of need you to do that. If God has brought you here, we need you to do that. Some of you might be sitting here thinking, well, Shane, I really don't like that. (laughs) I really want to do what I want to do with my life. And to you, I would respectfully share a a quote from that traveling preacher, Vance Habner. And he said, it is not our business to make the message acceptable, but to make it available. We're not here to see if they like it, but that they get it. So today, I hope you'd focus on the message rather than the messenger. And maybe you're sitting there thinking, "Uh, Shane, I have no idea what I should be doing with my life for the Lord. I I just, I don't know. My father-in-law was a pastor in my life, my period, period of my life in my 20s. In your 20s is a very, very impressionable time in your life. If you're a Christian, a lot of your theology is being formed that you will hold on to for many years very tightly in your 20s. This happens. And I remember one Sunday specifically He said, listen up. I'm gonna tell you what to do when you don't know what to do. It was like the whole room leaned forward. You heard the pews creaking a little bit, you know? And for me, I was ready. I had my pen in my hand. I had white space available in my margin 
for what I knew would be a pearl of wisdom to come. And this is what he said. He said, when you don't know what to do, do what you know you ought to do. I heard that, and I kind of scratched my head, and uh, I thought about that for a few minutes. <laughs> now, you've got to understand that my father-in-law has not one, but two PhDs, uh, one in theology and one in ministry. He's preached for over 25 years and taught young pastors in seminary for almost as long. When he's not doing either of those things, he has his nose in a book reading about, you guessed it, theology. And so when I heard, when you don't know what to do, do what you know you ought to do, I gotta tell you, I was, I was a little disappointed. I guess I was looking for something a little more, I don't know, profound? But you know, looking back over the years, that has been some of the most useful, most valuable advice I have been given in my entire life. Did you know that? I, it really has. When you don't know what to do, do what you know you ought to do. And what you ought to do is found right here in the scriptures. And as you begin to read the truth of God's word, it begins to transform you. You begin to change. God's word changes you, the truth of it. And as you do that, God begins to reveal his will for your life personally. And then you know what to do. It's not lost on me that I'm standing up here in front of you today, by the way. Uh, there's a lot of no's before, before a lot of this. And I gotta tell you, I'm grateful for the no's. Grateful for the no's. So you say, Shane, you, know, you don't understand the, the stage of life I'm in. I've got a sick parent. I, maybe you've got a disease. Uh, maybe you've got a child that's not following the Lord. And you're right, I've been through some stuff, but, but certainly not everything, maybe not what you're going through. In our passage today, King David is going through a transition of his own in life. And he's setting up his son to be king. And he's doing everything he can to make this transition as smooth and as successful as possible. Now, it's not a bad consolation prize that God tells you no, and then he says your son can do it. That's not terrible, right? I wouldn't be too upset with that. I think it would help the pain a little bit of saying no. But that's just just goes to show you how gracious and merciful God is, right? He is. And so, was David allowed what he wanted to do? He wasn't. When he tried to build the temple, the Lord said, no. And the rest of David's life could have gone one of two ways, depending on his response to that no. And so I believe he provides for us a blueprint of how we should respond when God says no to us. Our response to his no should be yes. Lord, whatever I can do to make your name great and point people to you. And when that's our underlying motivation, our goal, we'll never get hung up on no again. You won't. I don't know about what stage or what transition of life you're going through right now, but our passage teaches us today that we can trust God to be faithful even in the no. You know, this, this place where the temple is being built is a pretty special place. This is the area of Mount Moriah. This is where Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac. But he didn't. The Lord provided a ram, a sacrifice in his place. And this is an arrow pointing to Jesus coming in the New Testament. Who would be our sacrifice in, place, in the place for us? This is the most important transition you can ever make in your life, by the way. If you've never done this, if you've never given your heart to Jesus, there's no other transition that's more important in your life. Nothing at all. Have you done that? Have you accepted him as your savior? As a sacrifice for your sins? If you haven't, you know you can. You can. Bow your heads with me, please. Lord, we come to you today to say thank you for some of the no's that you give us in our life. I pray when that occurs in the lives of people here that they would say, yes, Lord, what do you want me to do instead? Lord, I pray for those who may not know you as Lord and Savior today. I pray they come to an understanding of the sin sickness that they have and that you have the solution for it, Lord. You provided Jesus as a sacrifice for us and I pray they would accept that today. 
Thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus. We celebrate that in this season. Thank you so much. And Lord, I pray for those who are struggling with the no today. Lord, I pray that you would give them peace and grace to say, yes, Lord, whatever you want, that's what I wanna do. Lord, help them today. We thank you for your word and how it changes our lives. In Jesus' name.